Well, good morning and Merry Christmas. Look out there and see all the pretty red. Y'all look so pretty today. Um, our children, guess what our children are learning about today, this last week before Christmas break? The Christmas story, yes. They are learning the greatest story that was ever told, that ever came true, and that is about the birth of Jesus, our Savior. It is a one, look at them, how cute they are. Oh my gosh, I just want to snuggle with them. And guess what? They're going to be in here in just a little bit. Um, they learned their lesson. They have their story, their craft. And then they'll be in here in just a little bit as soon as I'm finished talking. And they will be singing Christmas songs and reciting their Bible verses for us. It is always such a highlight and a beautiful way to wrap up our year. And I promise you will leave here this morning with a smile in your heart and joy and and it is just such a wonderful time. We're so excited about those little ones coming in here in just a little bit. So um, y'all hang on. Uh, the good part is, is coming. Okay. So this is our last week that we will meet before we break for a nice long Christmas holiday. Um, we will reconvene um, in 2024. That seems a long way away, doesn't it? But it's just, just a few weeks. So if you are part of this Second Baptist class that meets on Thursdays, we'll be back here on January. January 11th. If you are part of our remote classes, y'all will reconvene on Tuesday, January 16th. And I don't know, some of y'all might not be aware, we have a Chapel Hill class that we've just started. It's a live class, and then they watch a video feed of the teaching time, and they meet on Thursdays out in Chapel Hill. So if you're interested in that or you know anyone out in that area, let us know. We'll talk a little bit more about that after the first of the year. But they'll get going back on January 18th. Okay. I pray that each of you have a blessed Christmas season, and I pray that you will make it a point to find Jesus amongst all of the chaos that happens this time of year. Let's pray as we get started. Father, I just thank you so much for each lady who intentionally comes every week to open your word and have it change their lives. For your glory. Father, I pray that today as we open these Old Testament scriptures that you will be very clear and show us Jesus in the Old Testament. Father, we thank you for the blessings that you have given us. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so I, I started by saying I hope that we'll all make it a point to find Jesus Amongst the busyness, the chaos that is this Christmas season for most of us, right? But let's face it, it is easy to become focused and fixated on all the other stuff, right? The parties, the decorating, the shopping, the baking. And that's what takes a lot of our time and attention and our focus. And sometimes we can even make Jesus kind of an afterthought. And we rationalize this by saying, you know what, let me get all the fluff out of the way. All the busyness. Well, let me take care of that. And then on Christmas Eve, when we're sitting in the pew and worship, that's when I will find Jesus. Right? But what would happen? Think about this. Radical idea. Right? What would happen if during this busy Christmas season, if we made it a point of finding Jesus in all of those little everyday things that we're doing, all that busyness, we find Jesus in the baking. We find Jesus in the decorating. We find Jesus while we're out shopping, standing in line, and the line is getting longer and longer and longer. Right? We can find Jesus there. Yeah. We find Jesus in all of this. Right? How much more joy will we be able to extend to our families, to our friends, and even to strangers if we just make it a priority to make Jesus first in our lives and find him in everything? Seek to find him in the quiet and seek to find him in the chaos. The quiet as you wake up every morning, find him then. The chaos of the day and running the errands and getting everything and doing the parties and all the stuff that you do at Christmas time. Find him, discover him, intentionally discover him in those moments. And then as your head hits the pillow at the end of the day, remember to thank him because he had been there all day long. He has been with you all day. He is there. He is the reason that we celebrate this time of year. Find him in the chaos and find him in the quiet and discover the true joy and hope that comes 
at Christmas time. So as we open our text um, today, and there's five chapters of text, y'all. I am not even going to touch the last two chapters today. But we see that there is a lot going on in these five chapters of text, and you discuss that. There's lots of busyness, lots of chaos, some confusion, some miscommunication. I mean, there's just a lot going on. But it's when David sits and rests and is quiet, right? The Lord gives him a time of quiet and calm from all the busyness, that is when David and all of us as readers of this passage, that's when we find Jesus, right? So let's dive into the text this morning. As we begin, we see that it's, it's been about 22 years since Samuel came and anointed David as king over Israel. So it's been 22 years now, and the 12 tribes have finally coalesced all around David, and they are welcoming him, they acknowledge him as their king, and they are thankful that he is the king over all of Israel. And they say there are three positions which qualify David as our king, and you went through this in your study. The three qualifications, we have these up here. First, there is blood kinship, right? They said we are flesh and bone of you. In other words, David had the proper Israelite pedigree to be the king of Israel, right? He, he was kinfolk, in other words. The second is proven merit or value, right? And they said the scripture was, they said you brought us into battle and you brought us successfully home from battle. You, you gave us success in everything. So that, that's your, the value that you have brought to us as a kingdom. And then third, they, talk, they said, you have the divine authority. They said, the Lord said, you shall be shepherd of my people Israel and shall rule over all of Israel. So the people recognize that God has anointed and placed David as the king of Israel. And ladies, these qualifications for kingship, they are a template for the same qualifications that will be required of a king that will be born a thousand years after this in the little small town of Bethlehem. The threefold positions qualify Jesus, that king, to the same threefold positions qualify Jesus to be the king over our lives. So first, the qualifications of Jesus' kingship. Jesus' is human kinship. So he had the Israelite pedigree, right? He was fully human, Jesus was. He was is our blood relative. This is what causes him, allows him. Hebrews, that Hebrews verse says, therefore he had to become like his brothers in every aspect. Jesus was fully human and his blood qualified him to be king. Second, Jesus' proven merit, his value. That Second Corinthians verse says, for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So the perfect son of God, that's what gives him the value that qualifies him to be our king. And then third, Jesus' divine authority. And we all know this verse from Philippians. It says, therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that on, at his name, the, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God our Father. So he had the divine authority from the Lord to be the king. So as we look at both King David and King Jesus, we find that David and his kingship was a type, a picture, a shadow, a foreshadowing of the coming kingship of Jesus Christ. So here in these opening verses of this reading, we've already found Jesus, or we found a foreshadowing of Jesus through David's kingship, right? So it's foreshadowing what Jesus' kingship will look like. And then in the next few minutes, um, hang on, because when we get to chapter 7, we will see the actual promise of Jesus' coming. And so we'll see, actually see Jesus in this Old Testament passage. Uh, but hold on to that thought. There's a few things in chapter 6 I want to touch on before we get to chapter 7, which is really... Um, the main focus of this morning's lesson. So 
one of the things that David did as soon as he became king over all of Israel is he wanted to make sure he is unifying all of the 12 tribes. And so he moves his headquarters, the capital. He was in Judah, so he's going to move to Jerusalem, which would have been a geographically neutral site. Okay, And also this would have been a great strategic move because Jerusalem, if you've ever been there, it sits on top of a hill. So it, it's very strategic battle-wise. Okay, And so he moves to Jerusalem. Once established there, David realizes that the children of Israel still are lacking something. And it was the Ark of the Covenant and a central place for the people to worship. As their leader, David knew that he needed to go and bring the Ark home. Right? The ark symbolized the glorious throne of the Lord God Almighty. It was the symbolic embodiment of his power and his presence in the Old Testament. And for decades now, we read weeks and weeks ago, back in 1 Samuel, that the ark had been taken by the enemies, but the enemies didn't like it, right? So they returned it to Israel, but it has been sitting out with Abinadad out in a a town, a desolate town, out remote from Jerusalem. And so David says, let's go get it and bring it to Jerusalem. Verse 3, and they carried the ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadad. So you read the story, the ox is pulling the cart, right? The ox stumbles and Uzzah reaches out to try and steady the ark, right? Good intentions, right? But God struck Uzzah dead for doing that. And that's a difficult story for some of us to read because we look at that and we think, wow, God, that was kind of an overreaction, wasn't it? The guy's just trying to help, right? But ladies, this is such an important piece of text here. Um, Not just for Israel, but for all of us as believers, David loved the Lord with all his heart. There's, I don't think there's anyone here or anyone in all of history that would doubt that David loved the Lord. He had a heart for God, right? His, he was a, had a heart after the Lord. But as we're told many times in Scripture, specifically in Jeremiah, the heart is deceitful above all things, okay? God wanted more than just David's heart. He wanted obedience to his word. So it's not only your heart, but it's obedience. We have to be obedient to follow God's word. Okay? So let's take a look at the picture of the ark. We've seen this picture before. And you can see the rings there and the poles that go along that hold up the ark. Okay? Now the rings and poles are there so that no human hand would desecrate the holy dwelling place of the Lord. Okay? The Levites were to carry that ark with those poles. So they were supposed to go get the golden poles, put them through those rings, put the poles on their shoulder, and then walk and carry the ark. That is how Scripture, how God had told his people, this is how you are to do this, okay? Rings and poles, what's the big deal? They're just rings and poles, right? But The problem is for them, literally, for us figuratively, right, the rings and poles are a big deal. We think, "Ah, it's just details. Really, I don't want to go get the poles. They're in the storage unit. I don't want to go get the poles. Do do we really have to put them through the rings? I mean, that, that just sounds like minute details. Does God really care about details like that? Yes, he does. If he took the time to write it in Scripture... If he took the time to preserve it in scripture, then yes, he cares about the details of our worship. It's interesting that the Israelites at this point chose to put the cart on an ark. They had seen that's the way the pagan Philistines had transported the ark, right? They had put it on a cart. But apparently now a cart was going to be much more expedient. It's going to be a lot easier. You know, they're tired. They don't want to walk, right? And so they're going to put it on a cart. But ladies, here's the thing about expediency. God's ways are not always the expedient ways of the world, right? Have you noticed that? Um, The way the world handles our religion, our faith, our worship, that is not the way God calls us 
to deal with our religion, our faith, and our worship. The problem here is that the ark wasn't just simply an artifact, that, um, a piece of furniture, right? It, was, it represented the presence and the holiness of God. And they were disregarding his holiness in exchange for expediency. And here's the point. There is a big danger in treating worship, in treating God, in treating the Lord as a mere artifact and not seeing God for who he really is. Because above all else, he is holy. He is holy above everything. So David's motives were right. But they must be done in accordance with God's word. Okay, I found this great quote. God's work must be done in God's way if it is to have God's blessing. Okay, God's work must be done in God's way if it's to have God's blessing. The fact that all the leaders of Israel stood around and said, yeah, let's put it on the cart. That doesn't make it right just because the leaders all agreed on it. Okay, it didn't make it right because it wasn't how God called them to do it. Okay. The church today needs to learn this lesson. Just because the congregation says, yeah, that's good, let's do that. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's God's will. And it's what God wants us to do. No amount of unity or enthusiasm can compensate for disobedience. When God's work is done man's way, and we imitate the world in doing what God has called us to do, and we obey the world rather than obeying God's word, we can never expect God to bless that. Never. The crowds may agree with us. They may applaud. Yeah, do it, do it. It sounds great. We may have the crowd's approval, but God's approval is what we should be striving for. God's approval. So a lesson that we all need to learn about God's holiness and doing God's work in accordance with God's word, okay? And so now we move into chapter 7, I think the, the highlight of our text today, the main event. This is where we actually find Jesus, okay? So the king of Tyre, who was an ally, sent supplies and contractors to build a house for David. And they did. They built this beautiful structure, and it was very nice, especially compared to the caves that he'd been living in and, you know, running around for years. And so let's pick up there in the text, chapter 7, verses 1 and 2. Now, when the king lived in his house and the Lord, that the Lord had given him, the Lord had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies. The king said to Nathan, who was one of David's confidants, Nathan, Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. So the Lord had given David rest. Did you see that in the, in the text? What a beautiful picture that is. Because when we think about it, from the moment David was anointed by Samuel, 22 years before, David's life had been constant movement, constant activity, right? If he wasn't fighting battles out on the battlefield, he was running for his life as, the, as King Saul chased him, trying to kill him, right? But the scripture says, finally, the Lord has given David rest. What a beautiful picture. What do you do when the Lord gives you rest? I know for me, especially this time of year, I'm go, 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 go. There's always, I, I, got a, I ran into someone who was, at, we saw each other at TJ Maxx. I had two seconds. I ran into TJ Maxx yesterday for not. Didn't find anything. Anyway, so but I'm go, go, go. When the Lord finally does give me that rest, it is hard for me to get into rest mode because my brain won't shut off. And I'm constantly thinking, what do I do next? What's my next plan? What's my next goal? Where I need to go, right? So it's hard to rest. I don't know if that's what was going on with David or not, if his mind just couldn't shut off because he's so used to going. But he's walking around this house and he's looking at the luxury of, of, that he's living in. And the fact, and he, he starts thinking, you know, I, this is amazing, this house, and I'm grateful for this house. But the Lord doesn't live in a beautiful house like this. He's living in a tent. The irony is not wasted on David here. And so he decides that he will build, because he loves the Lord, he will build a house, a temple, a building where the Lord's presence will dwell. But that night God spoke to the prophet Nathan, verse 8. 
Now therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be prince over my people Israel. So God tells Nathan, look, I want you to take this message to my servant David. And I want you to tell him that the best thing that you can do for me is to continue shepherding the people of Israel and setting a godly example for them. Later in the text, we saw, see that the Lord says, you know, David, I know you wanted to build me a house. And that, that's great. But thanks. But no thanks. I don't need you to build me a house right now. The people don't need a house of worship right now. What they do need is a shepherd, David. So I want you to be their shepherd. I want you to care for them, to tend for them, and to lead them. I feel like David was probably disappointed because he's told, no, no, I don't want you to build the house for me. You know, it's just because our heart is in the right place, and David's heart was in the right place, just because it was a noble cause, oh, is there any other noble cause than building a house for the Lord? Just because our friends cheer us on and Nathan's like, yeah, go for it, good idea, it doesn't mean it's God's will, right? Every plan we design for God isn't necessarily God's will. And so this is where discernment comes in, and we need to be discerning women. But David's disappointment didn't last very long because the Lord continued speaking. And what we see in chapter 7 is a messianic promise. And it is a key passage, not just in 2 Samuel, not just in the Old Testament, but in all of the history of salvation. This is a key passage. Verses 8 through 17 of chapter 7 are what are referred to as a, the Davidic covenant. Okay? This is an unconditional covenant that God made with David and he, in which he promises that David and all of Israel, that he, sorry, he promises David and all of Israel that the Messiah will come through David's line, okay? And the Messiah will rule forever and ever. Okay, this covenant is unconditional. In other words, it does not depend on whether or not David or the Israelites are obedient to what God is calling them to do. This covenant, God is going to make sure this promise of the Messiah comes. Why? Because it rests solely on God's faithfulness. And because God is faithful, he promises he will bring the Savior who will rule forever. J. Vernon McGee, who is a very well-known biblical scholar, He's written um, what th that this chapter, he thinks, he believes that this chapter is the most important chapter written up until this point in the Old Testament. This covenant is a basis for all the prophets. Remember, you know, all the prophets that will come after David, that will prophesy about the Messiah, it all is based on this Davidic um, covenant, okay, and the promise of the coming Messiah. So I began this morning by encouraging all of us to make sure that we are intentional about finding Jesus in the midst of the chaos of this Christmas season. And how gracious is God at this point, our last lesson before we break for Christmas and celebrate the birth of Jesus, that the Lord just plops in our lap Jesus in the middle of our Old Testament scriptures. How I just love that God's timing is so perfect. So chapters 5 through 10 are filled with chaos. We're talking about chaos this morning, Christmas chaos. But we've been reading about chaos for weeks now. Okay, there's wars, there's death, there's punishment, there's more wars, right? But woven into that chaos is God's promise of a Savior. God begins his covenant by saying, verse 9, and I have been with you wherever you went and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more as formerly from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel." So the first promise of this Davidic covenant that God makes to David, God reaffirms 
the covenants that he's already made with Abraham back in Genesis, the promise of land, I will give you land and that will be yours. And also he reaffirms the Mosaic covenant that was um, given to Moses in the book of Exodus, okay? Ladies, these words written thousands of years ago, they could not be any more pertinent today. In the verse, I'm sure you heard, you read, God appointed a place for Israel and he planted them there. That is where they are today. And that is where they will stay. God promised it. Continue to pray for the country of Israel. Verse 11, moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, meaning when, when you die, David, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. So God kind of turns the tables on David. I just love this. He says, I know you wanted to build me a house, David. But how about this? How about I build you a house? And it will be established for all of eternity. So when we look at prophecy, there is, if, if you've been with us through a prophetic study before, you know that sometimes there is prophecy that is fulfilled in the near term, and then that same prophecy can be fulfilled in the distant future, okay? That's what we see here. In the near term, this prophecy of an offspring, a kingdom, will be fulfilled in David and Bathsheba's son, We'll read about that after the Christmas holidays, okay. Um, Solomon, okay. Solomon will come along. He will be the next king of Israel. He will lead the people, and the Lord will allow Solomon to build the temple, okay. But the promise continues, and it expands. This is the distant prophetic part of this. It expands to a kingdom and a throne that will endure forever. And this is a reference to the Messiah, King Jesus, who will be born. So let's take a look at the end of that verse there, verse 13. This is just the key to this whole thing. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. So this is the messianic prophecy prophesying about the coming Messiah. The promise that David's house, his throne, his kingdom will be established forever is significant because it shows that the Messiah will be from the lineage of David. Remember that bloodline, right? That's why this is so important. This bloodline is going to carry through to King Jesus, okay? And it also shows that the kingdom will reign forever with Jesus as king, sitting on the throne. And the covenant is summarized by those four words, house kingdom, throne, and forever. All four of those words are in that second Samuel passage, right? But let's look. Let's, let's bring this, wrap this all up with a bow here. God's promise was fulfilled. Let's look at Luke 1, the Christmas story. Luke 1, chapter 30. And the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and the kingdom there will be no end. So the exact wording that we find in 2 Samuel, which is prophesying about the coming king, and this is the fulfillment of that in the, the gospel of Luke. It's fun finding Jesus in the, New Testament, in the Old Testament, isn't it? Now, he's there on every page of the Old Testament. Make no doubt about it. But sometimes he's a little bit easier to find than others. And today was one of those times where we saw very clearly in black and white, in the midst of the chaos of the Old Testament, there was Jesus. I'm not sure what you're facing as you walk out those doors, whether you're facing chaos or quiet or a little bit of both. But I pray that you will be intentional about finding and focusing on him. That way you can find and discover the true joy and hope that comes through the birth of the Christ child. I pray that you will find Jesus and rest in his salvation. 
Let's pray. Father God, I just thank you so much for these scriptures that point to and clearly show us King Jesus. We thank you for this time of year where we celebrate his birth. And we know that he is coming back soon to rule and reign forever. Father, we thank you for the truth of your scripture. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, ladies and some gentlemen. Um, we're going to do a little re rearranging. Um, the kiddos will be coming in in about three minutes. So um, if you are wanting to get a good seat, come on up to the front. And the show will begin in just a sec. All right. Hello. Good morning and welcome. I just, my name is Becky Camp. I'm the next gen director of the children's ministry here. Um, we just uh, want to thank you for coming, all of our guests. So nice to have you here this morning to hear the message of Jesus through the mouths of these beautiful little lambs. Thank you for sharing them with us each week. Um, Suzanne Marekka is leading her class in here, and um, she leads our music time every week. So um, you'll see her down here leading the children, and we're so thankful for her. So um, hope you guys enjoy. At the end of the program, if you could just pick up your children at their classrooms, that would be great. So thank you. Put off with my glove. I need no overcoat. I'm burning with love. My heart's on fire. The flame grows higher. So I will weather the storm. What do I care how much it may storm? I've got my love to keep me warm. Yes, no, it's snowing, the wind is blowing, but I can weather the storm. What do I care how much it may storm? I've got my love to keep me warm. Yes, I can't remember how it was December. Just watch those icicles form. What do I care if bicycles fall? Baby, I've got my love to keep me warm. Oh, off with my overcoat, off with my glove. I need no overcoat, I'm burning with love. My heart's on fire, the flame grows higher.
He's the savior of the world, and now we can call him friend.
everybody. I just want to thank you so much for sharing your precious angels with us every Thursday. I hope I, I know I speak on behalf of all our CBS children's teachers of what a sweet blessing they are every Thursday morning. We find such joy in having your children with us to study God's word. Um, and we know in CBS that God's word is true. That's right. God's word is true. And so I hope throughout the Christmas season that you will celebrate praise and worship with them as they sing and make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Um, that's what we like to call it. We have about 15 minutes with them every Thursday. So I think they did an amazing job. Let's give them another round of applause. Great job, friends. Great job. So again, thank you very, very, very much, and we wish you all a very Merry Christmas. If you'll give us just a few minutes to get back to our rooms, we would greatly appreciate that. It gets a little crazy uh, getting from here to there. So if you'll just give us a few minutes to get them off the stage and then back to our rooms, um, you will collect them there with all of their things to take home. Again, thank you all for coming, uh, moms, dads, grandmas, aunts, uncles, friends, whoever joined us this morning. We are so thankful you are here, and we wish you a Merry Christmas.